Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, addicts of all ages, welcome to Canadian Sober, eh? I'm your host and resident alcoholic, Dougie Fresh. So glad you're with us today. I have a very special guest for everybody that's watching at home or YouTube or wherever you're watching this show. Um, I met this gentleman a little while ago. Uh, he's fantastic. He has so many things that, um, that he has under his belt. He's a pastor. Um, he's a YouTube uh, uh, channel guy. He has his own stigma. It's called Our Stigma. You can go to www.rstigma.com um, and, uh, and you'll find this man. His name is Seth Perry. He's half Canadian. He's half American. And, um, and he's just a really, really awesome guy. And I'm so glad he's here today to share his experience, strength, and hope with you all. So please, ladies and gentlemen, um, Seth, welcome to Canadian Sober. Eh? How you doing today, brother? I'm good. Thank you for having me on, Doug. I really appreciate it. I'm so blessed you're here today to, uh, to share with us. Um, please, for the people that have no idea who Seth is, um, please share with us a little bit your, of your experience, strength, and hope with us, sir. Well, I am uh, Canadian born. That's first and foremost. So uh, I grew up in Coquitlam, British Columbia, and I grew up in a middle class household. So life was pretty good growing up. My entire uh, childhood was was pretty good. My parents actually didn't ever drink. They didn't ever party. They didn't ever do drugs. They were pretty academic. And my dad was a professor. My mom has her master's degree and was in education. So they were all about you know, raising us up to be intelligent kids that read and also they you know said you got to watch public television on a black and white tv and you can only do it a half an hour a day and this was the 80s right so we had a pretty studious upbringing and that's the way things were uh so that's 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 how it started but when i when i hit my teen years i started to see that the middle brother in my family had some issues. Um, and that's when a family secret came out that I actually had a great uncle that had passed away. Um, and he passed away quite young. And he died uh, with some issues related to alcoholism and what they called manic depression back in the 60s. He died in the 60s. Uh, and that's when I found out that there's a history of mental health in my uh, family. So there's mental health diagnoses in my family. And I grew up in Coquitlam, British Columbia, where there was a large mental health institution. There was a lot of stigma uh, about mental health conditions and alcoholism, both in my family and in the community that I grew up in. So I immediately was ashamed about that as a young teen, and my brother was struggling through addiction and mental health issues. But at that time, I kind of looked out the window one day when he was coming home, and he was listening to rock music, and you know I wanted to rebel as a young teenager, and he looked so cool even though he was drunk and hanging with his friends, and even though he had had some particular behavioral issues, and I said, well, I want to, I want to do that, I want to be that, and I think a lot of alcoholics can uh, look back to a time where before they even started drinking or using, they said, that's the kind of life that I want. And so what happened next was I watched my brother go through some pretty hardcore stuff. He ended up in the psych ward twice. Uh, but there was that one point where I was offered an escape through using, and I took it um, as a teenager at around 15 years old. I said, fine. I'm going to I'm going to try this and when I first used it was that euphoria I completely just sort of escaped all the tension all the chaos in my life and all that stigma it just sort of just evaporated and so I wanted to chase that so I started chasing that and I went from being a studious kid to uh, not going to school to not turning in papers and not looking at my grades too closely so that I could go to university which was expected in my family and then what happened next was I barely eked my way through high school. I graduated, but with a lot of help from my parents, and they went in and talked to the principal. They, my dad, uh, you know, a professor at a big university in Canada, stepped in and he brokered a deal with my principal so that I could, uh, you know, kind of revitalize my failing grades and graduate that year. And this is a theme that my dad would always step in and kind of bail me out. So what happened next was I went into a deep depression because I had a major mental health incident uh, at graduation time. 
and I was really struggling. And that's when I went into, uh, a, you know, kind of a, a terminal stage of addiction that I scraped along the bottom for about 12 years. For some reason, I ended up getting into university and, uh, I had a really hard time with drugs and alcohol in university in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, it was really difficult because I was using most of the night and then I would go to class and then when class would end, then I would start using again. And I did that and I kept it up because in your early twenties, as many of us know, you can kind of get away with that level of partying. Um, and so I looked somewhat normal as I fit in with the rest of the partying students. But as they matured and grew up, grew up they kind of said, I think that Seth has a, a serious drug problem. Uh, and, and that was true. And it was proven by my first psychiatric unit admission when uh, I was at the point of graduating university and the same thing happened. I was in the psych board who stepped in. My dad stepped in, bailed me out, talked to some of my professors. I was going to the university that my dad was an administrator of. He was an associate dean of that university. So he came in and bailed me out again. And this is the theme in my life, right? Like the when unmanageability happens in my life, my family would swoop in and bail me out. And uh, I was in the psych ward for about eight weeks. And when I got out in about a week and a half, I graduated. And uh, that was one of the more terrifying experiences of my life. Because if any of your listeners know who've been in the psych ward, those first two weeks getting out of the psych ward is a jarring experience because you've been in a protected environment for so long and then you transition out and everything is just louder and brighter and scarier. And so walking across the stage in front of thousands of people at that university was a terrifying experience. And you think that I would learn, but I didn't, right? And at that time, I was chasing a dream of being a stand-up comedian and uh, I'd wanted to do that for my whole life. And so I kept chasing that dream, even though it meant drinking and using drugs with all the other comedians. Uh, so in short form, I ended up back in the psych ward again, but this time for a lesser amount of time. And then I uh, got out of the psych ward and said, well, I'll just start using again. And a year later, what happened? Back in the psych ward again for the third time. And then I started using harder and harder drugs and drinking more and more, so much so that I would wake up at four in the afternoon and immediately go to my dealer's house and then drink away the evening until about probably eight in the morning and then repeat. And that's what was going on until my uh, psych ward admission that got me into treatment. And it was a major crisis in my life. I felt like my body was shutting down. I had absolutely no hope. And my parents were worried and I'd go missing for you know weeks on end. They wouldn't know where I was. So they said, you got to go to treatment. And uh, and then that, that was what happened. I, I went to the psych ward for the fourth time, got out for a little while, and my parents watched me, close, me closely for six days to make sure that I wouldn't relapse. And then my brother and other people in my family got me into treatment. And that was the last time I ever used. I got into treatment and I was in treatment not for one month or two months. I was in for five months because I have a dual diagnosis, addiction disorder and bipolar disorder. They said, you have to stay in. You got to take every single step that we tell you to take. And I took that seriously because life got hard enough for me. It got it got so scary for me that I said, yes, absolutely, I have to do that. Uh, and then I transitioned out. And for two years, for two years, I stayed in sober living after getting out. Um, and I did that. I made the choice because they kept saying to me, people who were counseling me and also people in AA and NA, the two programs that I attend regularly, they said, you got to take every single suggestion that people make because this is how you're going to stay well. And so I did. I didn't do glamorous work. I wasn't a comedian anymore. I was working at Staples for three years, you know. Um, but I was content and I was surrounded by people that understood me and that wanted the best for me. And so I 
moved out of Vancouver and relocated to Nanaimo, British Columbia. And I stayed in Nanaimo for seven years. And those were a great, a, a great time of growth in my life. And I recommend to anyone in early recovery, if you have an opportunity to take things slowly like that, it totally worked for me. Like it was the best thing for me because I had complex things to deal with my mental health and my addiction issue. And I have bipolar disorder. And just so you know, I, I have dual diagnosis and I'm also a dual citizen, right? I'm a Canadian and American. So I've got that American side of me that's manic and crazy. And I've got that Canadian side that's totally chill, uh, you know? So that's, that's who I am. I've embraced that, but I needed to kind of just chill out and be in Nanaimo for a seven year period of time before I really reevaluated my life and took the next step. And so that's what I did. Uh, after working at Staples for a while, I found a job at a treatment center, uh, and then suddenly uh, something happened where I was feeling like, hey, I could become a pastor. And so I was like, okay, I've got my degree right now. i got a bachelor's, and it does qualify me to get a, a theological degree, uh, a master's degree, and I could become a pastor. So then I took that challenge at about four years clean. Um, and it was difficult. Uh, I went to work on my master's degree for about five years straight. Um, and that was classes, you know, throughout the day online. And I was flying to Saskatoon um, about three times a semester to take classes there. And then all the way back, flying back while I was working at the treatment center at night. So I was putting in a lot of hours. I put in a lot of work and I doubted myself. I really didn't think that as a recovering addict, I could help people. I truly doubted myself. But it actually turned out that I was pretty good at it. It was something that I was qualified for. I just needed to take that leap into the next step of my recovery and my life, really. Uh, so I've worked as a chaplain in a drug and alcohol treatment center. I've worked in an indigenous treatment center as a counselor, um, and I have uh, worked as a chaplain in a hospital. I never thought that I would be in an ER working with people who have just lost their loved one, but everything that I've learned in recovery has really qualified me to be with people at their darkest times. And then I became ordained as a pastor and started being a pastor just in a regular church. And I do funerals and I do weddings. I just can't even believe that Myself, someone who was getting up at four in the afternoon, going down the street to get my, you know, hook up from my dealer, uh, that I'm marrying people or that I am, you know, being a companion with someone as they die of cancer. Um, I, I didn't know that I had it in me, but apparently recovery has prepared me for that. And so at a certain time after, you know, working as a professional for a while, I said, hey, to my wife, you know, why don't we move to the States? And so we did, and it's been great here. I've been able to really blossom in my career. And after being here for a little while, I said, okay, here's the thing. I'm a pastor, I lead people, and it's awesome. But something's missing, right? I can tell everyone in, in the church, everyone who comes on Sunday, I'm a recovering alcoholic, I'm a recovering addict. And they say, I get that, absolutely, you overcame that. But I couldn't openly say to them, I kept it a secret, I couldn't openly say to them, hey, I have bipolar disorder. I'm diagnosed with a mental health condition and I take medication for that. And I have for 14 years. I couldn't say that. So what I decided to do in February of 2023 is do that, is to make an announcement, make a YouTube video and just tell them, hey, I'm a pastor and I have bipolar disorder and I'm going to start talking about it. And I didn't know that so many people would say, I have a brother that has bipolar disorder. I have bipolar disorder. Uh, I suffer from depression and I take medication for that. Someone in my family committed suicide, right? All these people that came forward with information of people who in their lives who died of suicide. Uh, suddenly I was like, wow, this, this, is, uh, this is amazing. I, I, I never thought I'd open the door like that for people. So I started writing about it and I started a blog called Our Stigma. Uh, and so, you know, now I run that website, www.ourstigma.com. And uh, I didn't think that people would be commenting on, you know, my writing that I put up on a weekly basis. Uh, and now I'm, I'm writing for a mental health publication that's local here in uh, Minneapolis. And I do that as well. I didn't think that 
you know, I would be a paid writer, a columnist for, for that uh, publication. And uh, I didn't think that I'd be able to live stream on my YouTube channel and talk to other people who are going through the same stuff that I am, that are publicly talking about their own mental health, their own mental health diagnoses and providing hope for other people. So even just last night on my regular Wednesday night live stream that I did, you know, to, to hear people that are 50 or 60 years old saying in the comments of my live stream that, you know, they normally don't talk about it, but they're okay talking about it in the YouTube comments of a video because it's an anonymous place for them to talk about their mental health condition. And so I was ashamed. I stigmatized myself and I did that for a very long time, even though I was sitting in the rooms of AA and sitting in the rooms of, uh, of NA and I was getting chips and I was speaking, I was sponsoring, I was full into recovery. But for, for some reason, it didn't transfer over to my mental health condition. I just didn't want to speak openly about that, even in the rooms of AA or NA. I just felt like that was an issue that wasn't talked about there. So just these last two years have been a new chapter in my recovery. And I didn't think that, you know, that was going to happen because once I got around 13 years clean, I thought, well, this is just the way it's going to be from you know, now until the end of my life that I'm just going to stay sober, I'm going to maintain my recovery. I didn't think there was another aspect to life. But really, that's what started to happen. And I'm really grateful for that. Because I get to meet people like you, I get to, you know, uh, come on a thing like this here and, uh, and chat about uh, how I'm really uh, someone who is uh, championing, uh, you know, destroying the stigma of mental health and addiction and, and you share that same passion with me so that's my life and uh and yeah i I'm, I'm grateful that i've been able to share that with you oh my goodness uh that um holy moly um seth that was uh that's very impressive um i'm 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 passionate about everything you 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 were just like talking about um but i am blown away at um at not only the service that you do but the way you give back to your community and the things that you do for your community um stigma is a huge part of 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 recovery and it's sad in in a way that it's still kind of out there when you were talking about this the 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 mental ward when you were going to the psych ward yeah um can you explain a little more about that? Like for the people sitting at home, like when you say mental ward or psych ward, can you kind of like, like tell people that it's like maybe not just for people who have like lost their mind, but there might be some other people there that are suffering from some other things and maybe kind of give the viewer at home a, a, a glimpse of, of what that actually kind of is when you say that. So for, for me, Going into the psych ward, you see such a diversity of people with a diversity of conditions. Those five trips that I that I had there, because the last time I was in, uh, you know, in, in treatment, that treatment center had psych psychiatrists, and there were a lot of people with dual diagnosis at that treatment center. So inside a psych ward, you will see people that are in the deepest depths of, of, of their existence. Uh, you know, not just people who are suffering from depression. There are people that I, that I see suffering from, uh, very, very, very advanced, uh, uh, you know, conditions like schizophrenia and, uh, uh, you know, and they, they themselves have not gotten the help for, you know, the majority of their life. The, the help that I, was so graciously given by my parents, right? My parents really helped me along the way. But if that was taken away, then you see people in psych wards that have developed uh, serious um, addiction issues as well. Some, you know, maybe even greater than I could even imagine. I always felt like there are people that just weren't getting that that help, that same help that I was, because you know I was grateful that someone in my family referred me to a drug and alcohol treatment center. So mm -hmm. our, our psych wards right now are, are full of not only people with mental health conditions, but there are plenty of people, uh, 
from specifically the fentanyl crisis that are that are in our uh, mental mental health wards and psych wards. Um, and and I am confident as I continue to learn about this and advocate for it that there are better ways than what we have set up right now. We still have a lot of very very old and archaic ways of treating treating mental health conditions because I was just simply incarcerated. That's it. You know, mm -hmm. I was locked away and sure, some of, in some ways it did me some good, but also I still have trauma around being incarcerated and, mm -hmm. you know, being strapped down and being held down by security guards. You know, that's something that is just the run of the mill life for some people with psychiatric conditions with dual diagnosis and, and, right. and, and, and addiction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like when you talk about like, you know, different types of people in there um you know drugs and, and alcohol like alcohol in, in my opinion is a drug it's it's it i think it was labeled as a drug a few years ago um uh so when you know somebody like a normal person who may not experience you know drugs in their whole life and then all of a sudden start taking drugs they might experience mental you know issues because of of taking drugs or, or things like that mm -hmm. um you know uh I, I want to learn more about, um, you know, the faith aspect. Like when you, when you decided to become a, a pastor, um, was it like, like explain a little bit about that. Was it more of like a thing to kind of like follow in the footsteps of somebody else who was kind of like done that? Or was that just like kind of a spur of the moment, you know, thing? Like, I'm just going to be, you know, like a little, like a little boy sitting at home or something. I'm going to be a firefighter. You know, and and yeah. you were like, I'm going to be a pastor. Like, how did that situation come along? So I was presented, you know, in my life with two options. I think it was become a licensed uh, addiction counselor or become a pastor. And because chaplains had had such a huge role in my life, that sort of seed was planted when I was in treatment and there were chaplains there. But uh, a few other things happened along the way. There's an author and pastor named Nadia Bowles Weber, and I suggest to read all of her books, but starting with her memoir, Pastrix, it talks about her addiction and mental health issues. And I really love my dad. We see eye to eye on so much. And he recommended me to her. And he kept saying, hey, Seth, you got to check her out. You got to check her out. She's a pastor. She's a pastor. She's great. But he didn't tell me that she used to be a comedian, too. So when I finally read her book, uh, I just thought, wow, th this is amazing. And since then, I, I had a chance to go to an AA meeting with her. And I said, you know, how did you do it? How did you get writing? How did you write four books? You know, what is it? And and to to have that moment of my life where I'm like, you know, this I, I had a, I, I, I'm going to tell her the next time I see her that she was instrumental in leading me to become a pastor. But it was just all those little things because I thought that I'm wired in a particular way where I can't help someone as much as I want to as a counselor. Many other people can, but as a pastor, I think that there's a lot of gifts that I have that really can help other people in all sorts of ways of, of life, not just in addiction and mental health, but if they're going through cancer, grief, if they're just uh, struggling in any way, I just seem to have all those gifts that just lend my lend it lend itself to pastoring yeah yeah that's amazing um mm -hmm. cool um you know there's so many things i want to ask you it's driving me nuts there's not enough time uh you know um like like you yourself like okay uh the stigma when it comes when you're out on the street or something like that and people look at you and you're you got arm sleeves you got tattoos all over the place you know um and then all of a sudden you you know someone will say you know like oh seth seth is a pastor you know, yeah. like, uh, do you kind of get like a weird look or do you kind of like, is that yes. kind of a stigma thing for you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I <laughs> really, I really embrace that. Absolutely. Because uh, if, if someone is like, you're, you're not, you didn't look like a pastor at all. That that's that that's crazy. Uh, then I say, yeah, but I'm I'm not going to evangelize to you. I'm not going to force any of my beliefs on you. Uh, because spirituality, the way that I see it, is a facilitation. 
It's it's not evangelism. I want to facilitate people in experiencing spirituality as they understand it. And for some people, they do not want to be involved in spirituality in any way. But I can still relate and talk to those people because our our rooms are full of those people as well. You know, if I go to AA meetings, I meet I meet ton of people where I'm like, they're like, you know, what spirituality and God and all that. You know, that's a personal thing. This is what I believe. But I can still have a conversation with. with them. So yes, I surprise people that I'm a pastor because of the sleeves and everything, but I certainly use it as a way to continue to have conversations and dialogues with people. So that's, yeah, that's awesome. You're, you'll be like, uh, you're the young hip guy and that'll uh, relate to a lot of the young kids coming in. Um, you know, I, I was scrolling through your Facebook page today and I saw something that, um, that is, is going to be close in my heart coming up here very soon. I'm going to be working with a, with a company here in Collingwood. It's a mobile soup kitchen truck. They yep. feed uh, the homeless and uh, they do some other things uh, within our community. And I'm going to uh, be interviewing actually a lady from, from that facility and, and working with them a little bit. Um, you're, you're working with a, a company. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Please show me. Yeah. Table, yeah. Pay as you can. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm a board member now on uh, a ministry called Shelby's Table, and it is a food truck and it drives to four locations in Minneapolis. Uh, and so I, I help and advise and I donate money and help fundraise for, for that organization. So anyone anywhere can just come out and come out and show up and pay whatever they want. If they want to take food for free, doesn't matter if they say, I want five portions i'm going to take them back to my house no questions asked there's enough food they will feed people and uh and it, it is a ministry that um you know my church here supports you know graciously we raise money for them but going to those sites myself i've i've been out since i've been a board member there going to the sites where Shovey's table feeds people you get to see all of the crises that we are experiencing in this world. You see the fentanyl crisis and the mental health crisis. People are not getting treated for their mental health and they don't, they don't have the opportunity to put food on the table. Uh, people are not getting appropriate services for the fentanyl crisis. They're not able to put food on the table. So there's a reason why Shelby's Tables truck has, you know, naloxone kits in it because it's in the neighborhoods here in you know, St. Paul and Minneapolis that definitely need that type of service. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing, man. Listen, I, I want to thank you so much. The stuff you're doing is amazing and it's incredible. Uh, please keep up the great work and, uh, and I'll, I'll get you back here another time. We can talk some more, brother. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks awesome. so much. Thanks everybody for tuning in to Canadian Sober A today. I'm your host, Dougie Fresh. This is Seth. We'll, we'll bid you peace and farewell and see you next week. Have a great, great uh, day, everybody. Bye.